Today, we're going to be talking about finding your creative voice on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all these stories and challenges that happen in between, as always. With this show and every show here on Behind the Shot, you can find the show notes at BehindTheShot.tv as well. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, if you head down below the like and subscribe button, you will find all the links or at least most of the links down there as well. But if you go to the blog at BehindTheShot.tv, I actually write a little blurb about my guest and I've got a small sample gallery of their work so that you can kind of get a taste for all the different types of things that they photograph and then you can go to their portfolio and look them up a, a, a little bit more if you'd like to. I want to get right into today's guest because today's guest and I have spent a lot of time getting this show set up because we went back and forth on a number of different shots. And as we go through, you'll kind of understand why it was hard to pick a shot with Leah Horstman. Leah, how are you? I'm good, thank you. It's so good to see you. I know. It's been a long time since I've seen your face, and it is wonderful to see you, even if it's over the magic of the internet. Um, I mentioned what you and I went back and forth, and here's why we went back and forth. For those of you that don't follow Leah on, on social media, and again, as, as we're talking, if you're watching the video, there will be lower thirds popping up under Leah that give you all of her social media links and her website, etc. And as well, if you go to the blog post, you can find those links as well. But when when I describe you to people, I was telling my wife I was going to have you on. I was super excited about it. I said, she said, what does she shoot? And I literally had to stop for a second and go, I think it depends on what day you ask her. Because <laughs> she's a landscape photographer. She's an equestrian photographer. She's a motorsports mm -hmm. photographer. And near and dear to my heart, you are also a music photographer. So yeah. when people say to you, Leah Horseman, what do you photograph? What is your answer? Everything. Okay. Almost everything. Easy. Almost oh. everything. Um, I am not a family wedding baby photographer because I don't know how to pose people. And that scares me to death. So I, that is not, there's people that are amazing at that. And that's a great thing for those folks. But, uh, I like things that move fast and I don't have to pose. You 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 just struck a memory in me of what was the I can't remember who said it was some famous old singer or actor. Was it Bob Hope that said never work with children or animals? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you actually <laughs> work with one of those. So we will, you know, some horses are children too. Your your story into photography is interesting. As I was researching you, there's some there's some things about you I learned that I think I've seen on a regular basis and th some things that really surprised me, but the most fascinating thing was the circle that your life has taken. It, it, it's almost as though life guides us where we need to be. So let's start at the beginning. Your dad, who, if he watches this back, he helped get us set up tonight on your end. So Leah's dad, what's your dad's name? Ken. Ken, yeah. I owe you. Whiskey, something. <laughs> uh, your dad got you started in photography, gave you your first camera when you were 14. Yes. But something in your story, and, and, and I've seen that before, right? I've seen people getting cameras as, as children and it, and it sticking with them their whole life. And it ended up it did for you, but you did give it up for a while. And after college, you went into competitive uh, horse competition. You yes. won multiple world titles in cutting. Is that correct? That is, yes, that is correct. Okay, for the uninitiated, you already you already know what the question is. What is, what is cutting? cutting? Yes, <laughs> um, cutting horses are a very unique and special breed of horses. It's an event. It's a judged event. Um, it's timed. It's two minutes and thirty seconds. And basically, it originated back in the old cowboy days, where you had to actually go into a herd and cut out a cow um, in order to doctor it. And, you know, give it its shots, give it its vaccinations, brand, um, whatever the case may be. And so that's where its origin is from. And then that ended up just like most rodeo events, you know, they all came from a need back in back in the day Actual or on a working ranch. Yes. Right. And so um, you basically go into the herd with your horse and you pull out, you filter it down to one cow and then you drop your hand. Your horse does all the work and you basically keep that cow from getting back into the herd. 
Um, and then you, you cut two cattle. It's a two minute and 30 second run and it's judged. And these animals, you know, when you're in the arena competing, you're basically not doing hardly anything. The horse is doing all the work, but the years of training that go into getting that point to that point is, is crazy. And these animals are so well trained and it's a rush. It's a great event. So here's Leah photographer from 14 gives it up to do this. And then you have an illness that causes you to give up competitive horse riding. And again, step in Ken, we should get Ken on here. Step in Ken <laughs> says, yes. Hey, Leah, go back to photography. And here you are today. You end up photographing horses again. Yes. It all came full circle. It's Isn't that weird? Very ironic. Yeah. Yeah. So they never really left my life, you know, which is a good thing. And uh, even though I wasn't able to ride anymore, um, you know, I was lost for a minute there without the horses. It was who was Leah without her horses. And that's when dad stepped up and said, you know, this was always your love. This was our love. We did it together. And, you know, have you thought about picking the camera back up? And uh, at that point, it was a no brainer. And I did. And then kind of it's like, but what do I shoot? What do I do now? And for about two years, I shot birds because they were in the, you could shoot them anywhere. And I didn't know anything about birds and started buying books. My friends got me that movie, The Big Year. I mean, just began learning everything there was about And if you can shoot a bird, you can shoot anything. If you can focus on a flying bird and get a good shot, I tell you, that's, that's the best way for a new person to learn how to shoot, shoot birds. So, uh, okay. You, you said something though, that immediately <laughs> triggered a question. So yeah. today, if you had to say, let me, let me back up. Something you said made me think, wow, horses were your identity, right? It was, a, yeah. and, and I have the same affliction being on the radio is part of my identity and being a music photographer is part of my identity and, and over COVID and all the shutdowns, not being able to photograph, uh, live yeah. music because I, you know, I'm not a bird photographer and I'm not a landscape. Yeah. I, I photograph almost nothing but live music. I had yeah. felt like I had lost part of my identity. So which yeah. would you say today is more your identity, the horses themselves or the photography? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, it's always my goal to hear that phrase right there. That is a good question. Uh, I, it's, I think they're still tied together. Definitely more the photography than the horses. But like you said, you know, I, I work for a company called Professionals Choice and we manufacture horse products. So it's become a huge part of my job to do all the lifestyle and all the product photography for the company. So I'm sent to, I'm sent everywhere. And I have been very fortunate now to shoot people that here's a, here's an ironic story. When I was cutting, there was probably the biggest name in cutting Bob Avila. He's a multi world champion and somebody that I just, you know, it would kind of like be you getting to meet uh, Dave Grohl, you know, just somebody that's huge in your industry. And this is a man that just, I, you know, I admired and I idolized and I never got to meet him the whole time that I was actually showing horses. But now he is an endorser for the company I work for. And I get to go to his home, stay in their guest room and do all his photography. And so the, again, the full circle of that, so that cool. He, is amazing. And now I'm eating dinner at his house and I'm best friends with his wife. And he was just this year inducted into the AQHA Hall of Fame, which is a, a big deal. It's like going into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. And asked me to shoot the photo of him, the big portrait that would forever hang in the AQHA Hall of Fame, which I did. And uh, they sent me photos of it from the induction ceremony just last month. And the honor of that is just crazy for me. So, again, full, cool uh, again, kind of this, this, it's this full circle. And it's like what I said, life, yeah. life guides you sometimes to where yeah. you are supposed to be. You shoot effectively like I do in a way you shoot action. You also do music photography. You yeah. ended up shooting dune buggies and NASCAR and yeah. you've won a lot of awards, but I want to focus on one award really, because Okay. This this is intriguing. So the Nat, the Nature Conservancy's annual photo contest. You yeah. entered that in a year where there were over 17,000 
entries. Yeah. And your image, Christmas on the Merced, won the grand prize and photo of the year and ended up in the San Diego Natural History Museum. Good feeling, yes. I'm guessing? Oh, yes. <laughs> that was, I don't even know if there's words to describe how exciting that was. Um, very unexpected. And again, that was an image that, you know, I came came from another one of those crazy stories. I was in kind of a, a dark place. My daughter had just left. My daughter is my mini me. She's my, my soul. And she had just left to move to Japan for three years. And so I found myself alone at Christmas, didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, you know, I'll throw the camera in the car and I'll drive to Yosemite. And I get there and it's blizzard conditions. And I had a tent. And it's like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> it's Christmas Eve. I'm in Yosemite by myself sleeping in a tent in a blizzard and literally almost cried myself to sleep that night and almost froze to death that night. Got up in the morning before dawn and hiked to the edge of the Merced. And one of those just most magical moments in your life where something, there's definitely a higher power and I don't know, I'm not going to claim to know what it is, but as the sun rose, there was just a foot of fresh snow on the ground beautiful god rays in the sky and i got the most spectacular image in the most precious moment um and uh yeah that image w took the nature conservancy 2016 photo of the year well scott kelby has said a phrase i love and that is if you want to photograph beautiful things you got to go to beautiful places yeah. and that's the thing you know there's so many people who go park on the side of the road, walk off and go, why isn't my landscape photography like Leah's? It's because you got to go places. You've got to go actually suffer for the art as it were, which kind yeah. of brings me to this, this topic that we're going to kind of touch on as we discuss your photo today, because, and this is, this is like the first time this has ever happened. We're emailing back and forth. We were going to originally discuss a horse photo and we're going back yeah. and forth. And Leah sent me an email and in the email, she said, you know, you know, let's talk. I have an idea. I thought, that's interesting. Okay, let's see what it is. You know, what's your idea? And she said, effectively, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but not being afraid yeah. of shooting iconic spots. Just do it in your own style and put your own yeah. twist on it. And instantly I went, wow. Okay, because that's so true that that you know, we always talk about the fact of, oh, I'm at the Eiffel Tower and everybody's already shot it. So what? Right? right. Figure out a way to do it. It's almost like the, um, uh, uh, I can't think of the movie I was going to think of now with Robin Williams, uh, Dead Poet Society, where he mm -hmm. has him stand on the desk. Sometimes, or I tweeted something today, and that is if you're, you know, if you, if you find the only place you can stand is between the rock and the hard place, climb up on the rock and get a different view. It's the same thing. <laughs> You've got mm -hmm. to find a way to see things your way. Uh, and I use this phrase a lot on the show that you have to find your own photographic voice. Like when we do the critique yeah. shows that I do with Don Komarechka, I, I say that a lot. And that is you need to find your photographic voice. Some people use the word style. I kind of differentiate the two and that's going to be a personal thing to me. Mm -hmm. It's not style, it's voice. Style to me leans towards almost a vision in your head of processing. Photographic voice is everything. Where you put the camera, how you do the camera, what shutter you choose. And you have a very distinct photographic voice, both in how you shoot and in your processing. Do you see that when you when you look at your work? I do. Um, took a little bit took a little bit to get there. It wasn't really a conscious road that I went down. Um, but I think, you know, what pleases your own eye, you know, right. what styles you like and don't like. Um, and as I developed my own creative style, it basically just came out of, it almost comes from the heart. It's to me, you know, I get asked that a lot. It's like, what's the difference? And you know, what do you feel the difference in your work is? And it's, there's a difference between a snapshot and an image and an image that evokes emotion. And that's when I, I do give some beginning photography classes to, you know, some local people. And I think that's the the one thing that I try and emphasize is, you know, there, there, the difference is, is you have to put yourself 
in that image. You have to evoke emotion. And I guess if I had any um, photographic rule that I would follow more than anything, that would be it. You have to shoot not so much from the head, but from the heart. Oh, I like that phrase. And I would argue, I think a lot of people have the photographic voice already in them. And there's something inside them that won't won't listen to it, right? It's yeah. they're new and well, but I, I want to do this like so and so would do it that I that I whose work I like. And there's something inside them thinking of it, but they get they get stuck almost looking outside rather than inside. Um right. before we talk about the shot that we're gonna talk about today, just to remind everybody, a little blurb that I wrote about Leah, all the links to everything having to do with Leah, the links for everything that we talk about in the show. Uh, those are all over at the website at behindtheshot.tv. If you want to subscribe to this podcast, it's an actual podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, just so that you know, it is an actual podcast you can get wherever you get your podcasts. If your podcast service or app supports video, when you search for Behind the Shot, they'll be Behind the Shot and they'll be Behind the Shot dash video. If you're listening on Spotify or something, Spotify doesn't have video versions of podcasts, so you'll only get the audio version, but like Apple Podcasts, that has video. If you want all the links to subscribe, just head on over to the website at behindtheshot.tv. Also, I want to say uh, thanks to DVE Store for the HD video. You can visit dvestore.com for all your digital video equipment needs. And as well, if you are watching over on YouTube, make sure that you head down and hit the like button, subscribe button, whatever it is that you want to do. And one last thing I do want to mention before we pull up this shot. I believe that I'm going to be doing, I did one earlier this year for Princeton Photo Workshop. I did a workshop for them. And I think I'm going to be doing another uh, workshop for Princeton Photo Workshop next year where it's kind of in the works that we're setting it up now. But as we're heading into the holidays with this show, if you're looking for gift certificate ideas or anything like that, go to PrincetonPhotoWorkshop.com and the URL just popped up on the video uh, where you can find my show, which is slash remote slash action. And uh, that'll kind of get you set up with uh, some Christmas gift ideas. So I want to get into today's image because, as I mentioned, as you and I went back and forth trying to pick the image, we were going to do this beautiful shot of almost like a, a, a cattle drive, but like more from not from out in the field. They're coming down through some corrals. It's backlit. It's super warm. And then you came up with this idea and I went through your website and wow, this thing popped up in my head. Uh, this, th this image is amazingly beautiful and correct me if I'm wrong. It's grist mill, correct? Yes. It's Cedar Where Creek grist mill. It is in Woodland, Washington. Okay. And there's, uh, I got a ton of questions on this. I'm going to start like I always okay. do. Let's start with the technical stuff because there are people who just, they're new at landscape. They want a baseline to go off of. They understand they can't recreate this depending on conditions, day, sunlight, rain, whatever, uh, baseline starting point. Do you remember what your exposure was for this? Um, it was shot at F11 and it was a long exposure. I think it was 85 seconds long and oh. shot at ISO 100. And I looked up the EXIF data. This is 33 millimeters. It's a Canon 5D Mark IV. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, with a EF 16 to 35 F4 L lens, yes. which is such an amazing lens. Yes, Everybody is. buys that lens and thinks that you have to use it at 16 all the time. This is almost at the, at the zoom end at 33 out of 35. And it's just such a beautiful piece of glass. There's a couple of things in that exposure data I want to dive into really quick. Okay. First of all, EXIF data showed that you had manual white balance set. Do you normally do that? Um. In my landscape photos, yes. What do you set it to? Do you do you know off the top of your head? On this one, I set it a little bit warmer because it was a very, it was a very cold day, and I wanted to warm up the the forestry look of it a little bit. And I I tend to do that. I don't like my images, and you know, it's personal preference. A lot of people like that blue or gray tone to their images. And I like mine a little on the warmer side. There's that photographic voice. Why F11? I mean, I, I think I think you just wanted as much depth of field as you could. Yes, yes. So one of the one of the the difficult things with long exposures, like even you said, it was really long at 85 yes. seconds. 
that's a difficult thing for people to decide, right? People go out, they're not long exposure experts. They go, do I do? I mean, is 15 long? Is 30 long? 85 seconds is almost a minute and a half. Yeah. W was that your first try and you knew you wanted 85? Why did you w know that you wanted 85? Um, I did have a 10 stop filter on this one. Um, for me on the, the an longer, the, yes, yes. Okay. I had an oh, so this was, stop. this was like daylight, like bright. Uh, this was shot about two thirty in the afternoon, I believe. Oh, so, um, okay. yeah. And for me on those long exposures, when you use a filter, it really richens up the colors. And, you know, if you go through my portfolio, I think one thing you'll notice is that I love color. And that is one thing that the longer the exposure, at least in my opinion, is you, it really richens up those tones. And I'm a fan of those uh, warm wood, you know, with the, right. the light of the sun peeking through. Um, I love a rich, colorful image. And, and here... Let me let me describe the image as I say this because I do this for every show. For those of you on the audio feed, don't try looking at the picture while you're driving. But keep in mind, you can go get the video version and watch it when you get home if you want to, or watch on YouTube behind the shot on YouTube. So let me try and describe this, and and uh, I, I'm not sure where to start with this one. I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to start here. This image is dreamy to me. It reminds me almost of a, a photograph I saw once by Rick Salmon almost look like an Irish little stream or something. It's that, that rich, warm, golden color. And what you were just saying makes total sense because what's interesting here is the sun is peeking through the trees. I'll describe where in a minute. But the sun is peeking through the trees and it is, it is kissing limbs that are far away from it in just a, a wonderful way. And the wood of the mill has almost absorbed Right. A lot of times you warm up a picture, but structures don't take on the warmth the same way that a tree does. Here, the mill has absorbed that golden color. It's it's gorgeous. So it's an it, it's a mill. Okay, let's start there. Mm -hmm. The picture is kind of divided into two halves. On the left side of the frame, literally from the the top third to almost the midway point, is the main floor of the mill. Below that, however, the mill is on stilts in the middle and on land, on like little small hills uh, covered in foliage below it. So it's like two stories. Yeah. And above it are trees. Then to the right of that, there's a very long exposure, blurred stream, river, whatever you want to call it, and creek. Okay. And that creek at the bottom of the frame is almost full width. So there's a little bit of green on the right, a little bit of green on the left. It's almost the full river. And that river winds back to the bottom right third of the image. And straight above that, just above the top right third, is the sun peeking through the trees. And it's coming through those trees in a way that you would see almost in animation. It's, it's, it's dreamy and rich. And the trees are still green, but just kissed on a ton of branches is this wonderful water. Now at the back side of the mill, which is almost halfway through the image, there's a water chute that goes all the way across the image, which is really cool the way that it kind of bisects the top trees and the bottom river, right? The, the, the river only goes up to about halfway. Um, the mill, again, dark, it's worn, but has the, the warmth to it. Your crop choice here was beautiful to me because there's a sign at the top of the mill. And thank you for not, for thinking, I, I know you thought about it. There's no way you did this accidentally. You didn't crop the middle of a word. So clearly the words are not cut in half. You can see mill, you can, et cetera. Um, river, like I say, glassy, smooth and gorgeous. And the trees, everything like, like a mossy green, whole thing reminds me of, I'm almost, I don't know if I should say it or not, but I'm going to. It reminds me of a Thomas Kincaid painting. <laughs> yes, it does. Right? Am I right? You see yeah. that in it no, too? No, it does. Yes. Like, I don't know if you I guys do. are old enough to remember Thomas Kincaid, but there used to be Thomas Kincaid art stores everywhere. And he, he <laughs> painted in this kind of mystic, 
dreamy style. So let's get into the topic that you brought up, and that is your voice. This location, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, is really popular for photographers. It is very popular. It's not as, as popular as Crystal Mill in Colorado, which you know we've all seen the fall images from Crystal Mill. Um, but I have seen quite a few shots from here. Um, before I went and shot this location, I actually, I looked online, I looked at how other people had shot it. I got some ideas because um, I'd never been here before. And I was there in the winter time, which normally you will see if you look at this, at this location, um, I would say probably 95% of the people shoot it in the fall, which I mean, I can understand a lot of those trees are fall trees that will turn, you know, real pretty colors. But I hadn't seen a lot of shots of it in the winter. And um, although there's not a lot of snow, you know, the roof of the mill is covered in snow, which to me kind of separates it from the trees and everything around it. So you're which not I should have mentioned, the, 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 the roof is white with snow, yes. as is a small ledge, like it's a secondary roof area kind of coming off the left side of the image. Yeah. So it's, it's a season that I hadn't really seen shot. Um, it's a, an angle that's, it's slightly different. I mean, obviously there's not going to be a lot of different angles here, but there is a covered bridge that spans. It's kind of behind me and to my left as I'm taking this image. And most people will just shoot from the center of the bridge, which has the river dead center down your frame. And it pretty much splits the scene in into two halves. And I wanted something angled differently. I wanted a little bit of a different season. You know, I knew the time of day I wanted to shoot it to get that sun, you know, lower in the sky because it was, it's, you know, even though it's about 2.30 in the afternoon, it's the dead of winter. So the days up north are much shorter. Um, so it was all kind of planned and timed around those thoughts in my head. Did you, did you know? Well, okay. You knew based on the time of day, right? Mm -hmm. That you're going to need, you know, some crazy ND filter because this is midday. Right. But, you know, a lot of people would go out there with a variable and not know what they're going to hit. It could be three, could be six, could be nine. Did you go out there knowing you were going to need a lot of ND, you know, neutral density filter? Um, a scene like this um, is typically what I would shoot it with. So it's just kind of in my bag of tricks. Um, you know, I carry, I'm an ambassador for Koken. So I carry a lot of filters with me everywhere I go anyways. Um, but yes, yeah, so a scene like this, you know, I didn't care that the river was that smoothed out. You know, if you're shooting waves or, um, sometimes waterfalls, you want to go long, but you want to go like a half a second or a second so that you still have texture in your water. Right. And in a scene like this, I wanted that, and you said it perfectly, that dreamy Thomas Kincaid look is exactly right. what I was after. It's, it's, and, and that's what happened was I'm looking through your portfolio, losing time because your portfolio is, is vast, right? I mean, you shoot a lot of different things mm -hmm. and this came up and it was like, oh my God, it's a painting. And again, it reminded me, I wish I knew the name of the shot that Rick Salmon shot. And it's, it's like this Irish green, you know, stream. Yeah. Part of the consistency I see as I look through your portfolio is your processing. You do go vibrant on the colors. Mm -hmm. You have an interesting sense of, of, of uh, relationship, spatial relationship of objects that are in your image. Again, here the placement of the stream. And like you said, it's different than what you would normally see at this place. The, the angle of the mill, the position of the sun, the, the, the way you were aware of that sign, mm -hmm. the, the spatial relationship you have of, of objects in, in your image is interesting. And then when you process them, some people could overcook that and lose yes. that. And yes. the, the processing becomes the picture instead of, that spatial relationship of subject matter. The, vib the the bright, vibrant coloring and this dreamy look that you get isn't mm -hmm. just in camera. What software are you using and, and how are you doing this? Um, I do everything in Photoshop. I have never used Lightroom. I don't have it. I know a lot of people do. Um, I do pull them originally into, into Camera Raw, which is basically the same thing as Lightroom. Right. Um, and I'll do my original tweaks there. And then I 
pull it straight into, into Photoshop. Um, you know, I've heard it both ways. I've heard, I've had people tell me that you have to have a plan when you're editing, that you have to have, have you have to go from A to B to C to D. And there's okay, a lot of people First of all, I just have like to interrupt that. you. When people say you have to in photography, no, I kind of just want to look at them and, 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 and kind of do one of these things. Do you really? <laughs> no. Like, no, think, you don't. Think about that. <laughs> do you really have to have a plan? Yeah. I'm guessing not. Go and, and now I'm, I know what I'm going to say to her. I'm going to say, go watch Get Back, The Beatles Get Back, and watch how Let It Be was made. Yeah. That's a plan. Like, noodling. That's it. Anyway, yeah, I'm sorry. Exactly. Go ahead. Exactly. And that, that is a great analogy because that's how I edit. I noodle with my images. You know, I say it's almost like being a painter in a sense. And I, I am very aware of what you said about not overcooking an image. Um, and in my editing process, I do let them marinate um, and I'll, I'll step away and I'll come back. And it's like, what if, okay. And, and I'll do it in just little, little increments until, I mean, I do have a general plan in my head of what I want it to look like. It's just getting from beginning to end. And I do it kind of on my own, my own time. And, um, are you, are you dodging and burning a lot? Are you doing multiple layers? Are you using plugins? Yes. Yes. All of the above. Um, so I do do a process where, you know, I'll use my brush, I'll, I'll click on it, I'll do a, a, a layer, and then I'll take my color, like where you see those highlights on those branches, and I'll just drag it from whatever color it is straight up to the top. So what's the lightest version of that tone? And then I will just kind of delicately paint some of those highlights in on my branches just to pop them a little bit more. Um, and then I'll change that to a, a soft light blending layer. And then kind of tone it back to where it's just enough to accent the light. It's it's where the light already is, but I right. want to pop it out just a little bit more and a little bit naturally. So I actually, I do dodge it, but I dodge it with a, under that color palette tone, if that makes Using sense. Using a soft light adjustment layer. Yeah. Yes. So yes. plugins, what's your, what, what, what are your plugins of choice? You know, I have several um, and it's, you know, you have these plugins and then you, you kind of have like your go-tos in there. Like I may only use one or two adjustments in there, but I know in my head, okay, I need, I need, so Sleek Lens is one of them and um, they have a landscape palette. They're not super well known, um, but they have just. I'm writing this couple... down. What's it called? <laughs> sleek, sleek Lens? Yes. And I do have Luminar. Um, and there's just a couple adjustments in each of those that I know what they are and I know when I need them. And I, and I, pull, them, I pull them out for specific things that I want to accomplish. See, um, I'm, do, I'm that way with Nick. Like for me with yeah. Nick, uh, I use Silver Effects Pro. Uh, often I use Silver Effects Pro on a color image, a technique that I learned from mm -hmm. Alan Hess. And then uh, also Color Effects Pro. There's a couple of things in Color Effects Pro that I love. One of them being Pro Contrast is amazing to yes. me. I love it. And it's worth the price of the entire Nick collection for those two tools for me. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, okay. And I do my own version of sort of an Orton effect, but it's not... I like, I know TK has a version, like everybody's kind of come out with their own version of that Orton effect, but I kind of do my own just through a Gaussian blur um, and then changing it to a soft light and then um, doing some adjustments in there. Um, and it, so for those that don't it know the Orton effect, it up. Mm -hmm. explain it that is to a, people. It just gives your image that final, and it's always the last adjustment I do on my image is, is putting that okay. on. And that's what provides a little bit of that dreamy look to your image. So I do it with a Gaussian blur at about 20, and then I'll change it to a soft light blending layer. And then I'll double click on it and bring it up. And then I split it to where I'm taking just because I don't like it. My image is too soft. I mean, some people I think on that Orton effect can get a little bit soft on their images. Um, and I, so I, I still want the crispness along with the dreaminess, if that, 
sort of makes sense. There's that fine line in there. That's the beauty um, of it, though. It's it's the beauty of it to me is I, I literally put my hand down, and my note came up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, sleek lens. I got to go look that up. So I want to do a speed round with you. Okay. These questions, just answer them as fast as they come to your mind. Okay. What is your top tip for people to help people see iconic locations differently? Top tip for that. Um, I mean, it's a little bit of a process, I guess. A like I did with this location, look it up, know where you're, cause I'd never been here before. Um, but once you get there, scout the location. So if you've looked it up, you kind of know what everybody else has shot. Um, you know, hot Creek is a perfect example. Everybody shoots hot Creek right down the center. When you get there, start scouting a little bit, look at it from different angles, you know, look at it from different seasons, different times of day. If everybody shoots in a, a location at sunrise, what does it look at sun like at sunset? Um, obviously keeping the ethics in mind, you don't want to go off trail and, and trample anything, right. but so within reason, but take an, a, an iconic location and make it your own. Okay. Make it unique to who you are. Using your eyes as it were. Biggest exactly. mistake you almost or did make. Biggest mistake I almost made. Photographic. Um, not like, <laughs> I know, not like a lot I, of oh, I, you know, I tripped over a curb <laughs> once. No, because the biggest yeah, mistake I ever made was I, I was really talking to somebody. Scar here from that Iceland. <laughs> See, I was talking to somebody once and literally walked into a, a light pole. So we all do things yeah. weird. Nobody that yeah. stupid is me, but still. Uh, so, what's your biggest <laughs> mistake you almost made or actually did make? Um, I that's a tough one. That's a good question. Um, I don't know that I made it, but. I, I think don't get caught up in the equipment game. You know, I, I did for a minute there, you know, you got to have the, I got to have this and I now, well, I have this now I got to go get that. And you can end up sinking your entire life savings. And the thought that I have to have every piece of equipment, I have to have the newest, the latest, the greatest, I have to take everything I have and trade it in on something else. Don't get caught up in that, you know, because it's not, about the equipment you're shooting with it's about again you know it's shooting it's your eyes it's your it's your heart it's your head it's your senses it's your it's it's from inside it's not the equipment that you're using it's right. how you use it and don't get caught up in that in that rat race of of gear okay. what is your favorite compositional rule or structure or do you have none you know, I do, um, you know, even looking at that image that we just looked at, you know, I do believe in leading lines. I love foregrounds. Um, you know, that particular image was more about, there's a lot of leading lines in here that draw you into the image. Um, so you have to have, and that is the difference between a snapshot and an image that really takes you in. So those are things that you do have to pay attention to. So yes, I do. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite drink? Favorite drink? Oh, coffee. Okay. <laughs> coffee all day long you you are a music <laughs> photographer as well like i am mm -hmm. what musician or band artist would be on the top of your photo bucket list mm, well i used the example earlier so i have to go with the foo fighters i would i you and you get it when you oh, yeah. it's the excitement it's the energy it's oh would they be fun to shoot that would you be know what's funny? my list I've been in rock, I've been in radio for 40 plus years and yeah. I've been in rock radio at KCAL since 1987. We play the Foo Fighters. I, I was honestly not a huge Foo Fighter crazy nut at all. Yeah. Like could have taken it or left it. And then I had a chance to photograph uh, the Foo Fighters Cal Jam and they headlined the show. I photographed right. a couple of Cal Jams. And as I photographed them in my head, I'm like, I literally am thinking, out loud in my own brain, I get it now. I get it now. <laughs> yeah. Live, that band is absolutely insane. So let's switch back to photography. Okay. Is there a photographer that you think more people should know about and follow? Oh, um, yes. 
actually. There's a gal by the name of Jamie. How do you say her last name? Bolschweiler. I always just know her as Jamie. She, we became friends back in 2016 um, through the Nature Conservancy. And she actually submitted some images, images in 2017, found me on Facebook, and then came back and asked me for some advice. And I started looking at her work. And she was kind of at the early stages back then. And she has gone all in on wildlife photography and the images that she is now creating. And she's out there. She follows the wild horses out in Utah and her images blow me away. And she is virtually unknown at this point. And boy, everybody needs to go look her up. She is phenomenal. So do me a favor because I'm not sure I'll spell that last name right. Excuse me. Uh, email me a link if you know I will. her website or anything. Email me a link. And okay. for those that want to follow Leah, all the information has been popping up as, as we've been talking under Leah. But let's just, for those on the audio feed, let's kind of mention some of the the important links where people can go find you. And again, you can find all of these links in the show notes at BehindTheShot.tv. So what's your website? Uh, website is LAHorsemanPhotography.com. Okay. And Facebook is the same, LA Horseman Photography. Uh, yes. Instagram, you have two accounts on I Instagram. Do. <laughs> Explain those. Um, I have my LA Horseman, which is all of my landscapes. Um, and then as I got more and more into doing the music photography, I found that Instagram's strange. It's a weird bird. If you start posting things, if people follow you for a specific reason, they follow you because you're a landscape photographer and you start, start posting rock stars in there and, and concert photography, I don't, it confuses them and they don't seem to like it. So I actually started a second Instagram. Um, it's LH rock shots and that's my music photography. Okay. So at LA horseman and at LAH for LA horseman underscore yes rock shots. And then on yes. Flickr, for those of you that do the critique shows and are active on Flickr and in the behind the shot Flickr group, uh, make sure you follow her on Flickr too. It's LA Horseman on Flickr. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. And again, thank you to Ken. I, isn't dad the best? <laughs> Dad's the best. That's what dads are supposed dad's to best. be though. Yeah. They're supposed to be the best. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Leah, really honestly. It's wonderful to see you. And I, I really appreciate your doing this so very much. Thank you. I'm so honored, Steve. Thank you so very much for having me. The pleasure is all mine. Make sure that you go check out the show notes. They're at behindtheshot.tv. Uh, all the links to everything Leah does. And of course, if you want to check out my website, it's stevebrazel.com. If you want to follow me on social media, that's easy as well. It's Behind the Shot TV at Behind the Shot TV on either Instagram or Flickr, and then or Instagram and Flickr or Twitter, and at Steve Brazel on Instagram or Twitter for my personal, not not the, the actual podcast one. If you do want to follow me on Flickr, I'm on there too. It's Steve Brazel. And again, that's where we do the critique shows. If you haven't checked out the critique shows, do those once a month with my buddy Don Komarechka. So check those out as well. Thank you so much for watching. This is Behind the Shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. We'll see you on the next show. 